Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation. I know that we still have many more folks who will be logging on, but in the interest of time and the rich conversation ahead, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Cultivating Trust-Based Leadership, the final session of the Trust-Based Philanthropy and 4D webinar series. I'm Susie DiMauro, and I'm a program director with the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a 30-year-old white woman wearing a dark blue long sleeve shirt, glasses, and with curly auburn, auburn hair and a ponytail. I have a virtual background of the Canadian Rocky Mountains in autumn behind me. I'm physically based on the unceded indigenous homeland of the Muncie Lenape people in Brooklyn, New York. This series is co-hosted by the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project, Environmental Grantmakers Association, Blue Sky Funders Forum, and the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders. We also want to thank our regional PSO partners who are here with us today and who are shown on this slide. Many of you are already introducing yourself in the chat. Um, I'd like to introduce you to invite your, uh, to introduce yourself in the chat and share a land acknowledgement. You can visit native-land.ca to learn about the native land that you are on. You can access live captioning for today's conversation by clicking the closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitles. You can also click view full transcript to view the transcript in the side panel of the meeting. Thank you so much to Karen Schmeider, who's providing today's CART services. I'd like to start us off with a short breathing exercise as we transition into being present in the space, apart but together. Please get comfortable and close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. Now listen. Coming into stillness, take some moments to scan through your body and just see what wants to relax, to let go a little. You might take a full deep in-breath, filling the chest, filling the lungs, and then a slow out-breath, feeling the sensations of the breath as you release. And again, a deep in-breath and a slow out-breath, letting your breath then resume in its natural rhythm, opening to your senses, feeling the breath in the foreground and relaxing with the background of sensations, sounds, feelings, and life. And now I will turn it over to Shadi Salehi, Executive Director of the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project to kick off our conversation today. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for that great grounding exercise. Um, I definitely needed it. I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, well, it's wonderful to be with you all for the fourth and final of our series on trust-based philanthropy in 4D. Um, even if you're just joining us now for the first time, we're going to be doing a little recap of what we've discussed um, in previous sessions. And what we encourage you to consider is that these discussions have all been cumulative and um, we'll be making space for continued learning um, today and ongoing. So um, we invite you to keep an eye out for our survey after this session um, to give us your feedback and let us know what more you'd like to hear from us. Um, in terms of our rundown today, we're going to have a really stellar panel discussion um, for the next hour, and then we're going to break into small group discussions. Some of those small groups will be facilitated by our co-hosting organizations and our partner organizations. Um, and for those of you who are not affiliated with one of the partner organizations or there's no small group um, for your particular org, please stick around in the large room where we'll have a discussion. Um, I forgot to mention, I am a 40 year old Iranian woman with shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a, a red orange shirt. I'm sitting in the corner of my home office uh, with a vase and a, a candle behind me. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am joining you from unceded land of the Ohlone people, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, so we're gonna just get a little grounded on um, why trust-based philanthropy and why we're here for this discussion today. Um, fundamentally, we hear a lot about trust-based philanthropy 
um, but we don't always have a chance to really explore why this this movement and this approach has been um, being lifted up and, and embraced over the last um, several years. What we're here to address is a values to practice disconnect that has uh, really taken root in a lot of our traditional practices and philanthropy. So a lot of philanthropic organizations may be committed to values like reducing barriers, advancing opportunity, building a thriving community. However, a lot of our practices and behaviors don't necessarily reflect that. So on your screen, you see someone representing a funder with a me megaphone, um, shouting out their values to a brick wall and communities and nonprofit leaders on the other side of the wall um, kind of puzzled by uh, and not able to hear what's being said. This is representing a lot of the disconnects that we see in a lot of our uh, traditional philanthropic practices, not just in our grant making, but in how we're showing up in relationship with grantee partners. So trust-based philanthropy uh, in essence is really an approach to giving that addresses the inherent power imbalances that exist between funders, nonprofits and the communities that we serve. So the core of what trust-based philanthropy is, is about redistributing power um, at all levels, systemically, organizationally, and interpersonally in service of a healthier and more equitable nonprofit ecosystem and a healthier, more de democratic society. So on a practical level, you may know that this, is, this includes multi-year unrestricted funding and streamlined applications and reports. Uh, but I wanna underscore, this is also about building relationships based on transparency, dialogue, and mutual learning. This, these values are what we're gonna be talking about throughout today's discussion in terms of how we embody them as leaders in this work. And we're gonna be talking about leadership at various levels. Uh, we recognize there might be formal kind of role-based leadership, uh, but we also want to invite you to recognize where you may have some situational power um, that we can address um, and, and embody and kind of recognize in our leadership style. So the core of trust-based philanthropy is that it is a values-based approach. Many of the values that we'll be talking about today are represented here. We're talking about working for systemic equity, redistributing power, centering relationships in our work. So recognizing that the role of philanthropy is to partner in a spirit of service to those who are working on the issues and closer to the issues at hand. We're also talking about accountability. And in that sense, we mean a two-way accountability where in a relationship where there's kind of that mutual, um, mutual sense of accountability wherein we're holding one another accountable to each other. Um, we're also talking about embracing a learning stance and a learning approach in everything that we do, both in how we lead and how we practice. So I invite you to listen for these values as we're talking. Um, and these values represent uh, a lot of what many, trust, many foundations that have been committed to trust-based philanthropy recognize as core values that drive their work. So while this may not be literally verbatim what you know, people who are committed to trust-based philanthropy might lift up as their organizational values, I hope that you can see some resonance in these values here as you think about how your organization approaches its work and how it wants to um, engage in its practice. And that lands us at the four dimensions of trust-based philanthropy. So part of this framework is to recognize that when we talk about trust-based philanthropy, when we, when we think about implementing these practices, it is not just, it's not solely about what we're doing in our grant-making practice. That is one piece of this greater puzzle, right? We're talking about embracing cultures that, that lead with values and organizational cultures that center the role of trust and relationship internally so that we're able to express and extend trust externally. We've talked about examining how trust-based values show up in your organizational structures. So the hierarchies, the decision-making processes, the systems, the grant management systems, the policies of your organization, your HR policies, the technologies that you use. So we've talked in the most recent session, we really examined how we can apply a values lens to our organizational structures. Today, we're gonna really kind of hopefully put a bit of a bow on this whole, tie it up in a bow <laughs> to the best that we can um, and explore what do we mean, what does it mean to be a trust-based leader? The role of leadership is such a key part of this four-dimensional framework. Leaders play a key role in aspiring and aligning around shared values, 
embodying these values and how we show up and really modeling the type of culture that we'd like to have and build in a trust-based context. So if there's without the buy-in and the investment of leadership, and then we're talking about leadership at various levels, then it's gonna be very challenging to fully express trust-based uh, philanthropy externally. So we really wanna dig into uh, what, what this means. Um, so in our definition of leadership in this context, it's the ability to inspire and align around shared values. And what I invite you to listen for in our discussion is how trust-based leaders can embody values of humility, curiosity, and transparency. And mo most importantly, there's a willingness to share power in order to build collective power. And this is really reinforcing a lot of those underlying values of what trust-based philanthropy is all about. We recognize that when decision-making power is held in the hands of a few, we're not really successfully gonna be able to tackle the issues that we want to tackle. This is about recognizing the, the, the power and the momentum of collective power building um, in, in all aspects of our work, in our grant making and in, in, our way, in the way that we lead within organizations. So with that, um, I'd love to bring up our panelists. Um, I am very delighted to be joined by John Esterly, co-executive director of the Whitman Institute, Jorge Blandon, trustee of the Whitman Institute, Brenda Solorzano, CEO of the Headwaters Foundation, and Maylee Walker, executive director of the Clinial Foundation. Welcome panelists, thank you so much. Um, really delighted to engage in this discussion with you all. So before we jump into our discussion, I wanna highlight a few perspectives that we have represented today. We have John and Jorge representing leadership of a spend out foundation, the Whitman Institute, which is in fact spending out um, in just a few weeks. So we are very honored to have John and Jorge here presenting on you know, one of their final webinars representing the Whitman Institute um, that has been a leader and an architect in, in this whole trust-based philanthropy movement. Um, and so we'll, they represent an organization that's been committed to trust-based philanthropy for quite a while and has had to think about embodying trust-based values as it spends out. Um, so that's one really important context to bring. We've also got Brenda Solorzano, CEO of the Headwaters Foundation in Montana. And Brenda has, been, uh, has held multiple roles in many different philanthropic contexts, but in her most recent role um, has had the opportunity to build a foundation from the ground up with a trust-based lens. So she brings that perspective among many others. And Maylee Walker from the Clinial Foundation that has been committed to many of the trust-based values that we talked about um, and has been very much on this journey um, toward embracing trust-based philanthropy. So representing kind of a perspective of a foundation that's been evolving um, and moving toward trust-based philanthropy. So um, we're really, uh, really honored to have these many perspectives on this panel and we invite you all to consider what resonates the most for you and where your organization is. Okay, so trust-based leadership. I, I have to say that John Esther Lee has been uh, a real model for trust-based leadership for many of us uh, in, in the field and in the trust-based philanthropy movement. Um, I'm very honored to have had a chance to know John and work with him for many, many years. Um, so I'd love to just start with you, John, to share a bit about what does trust-based leadership mean to you and why is this something that you think matters in the context of philanthropy? Thanks, Shadi. Um, appreciate that introduction and um, appreciate the invitation to join you all today um, in this discussion. Um, I'm John Esterly, uh, co-executive director of the Whitman Institute, uh, pronouns he, him. I am a 65-year-old white man with glasses. Um, uh, probably more gray hair than I want to describe, but a, a healthy amount of gray hair. I'm wearing a black shirt, uh, sitting on a maroon couch um, with a uh, little bit of a, of a, a painting behind me. Um, I'm uh, coming to you from Ohlone land in um, San Francisco. 
Um, and I, you know, as Pia, uh, Pia, <laughs> I was thinking of my co-ED. Shadi, as you were speaking, there, there was one phrase you used that just kind of jumped out at me. And I think that's where I would start in, in that there's a disconnect between our values and practice often. So I think for me, um, trust-based leadership starts from um, really the, the, I guess, the, the discipline and the orientation of embodying those values in every room you walk into and every conversation and relationship. Um, easier said than done because different rooms can have different contexts, different power dynamics going on, um, et cetera. But I think it's that commitment to really, really embody the values um, relationally. I think for me, when I, when the, the, for trust-based leadership does mean centering relationships and, and centering relationships, especially in the context of a funder means um, awareness of the different power dynamics um, and a commitment to um, uh, shift those. That's what, that's what trust-based philanthropy is all about. And so I think for me, you highlighted these values of humility and curiosity and transparency. I think those are all key. You know, how do we bring those into all of our relationships? Um, and when I say all, I mean, I think leading is partly working for alignment throughout your organization so that the board, the staff, everyone involved is, is aligned. That's often not the case, or you know, there can be a lot of strategizing that goes on within an organization. Oh, how can I can I use that language with my board, or how can I get you know? I've heard a lot of that over the years of just. So I think working with curiosity and humility and transparency to create alignment throughout the organization is really important. Um, and for me, that has always been listening, le leading with listening, um, the sense of coming from a place of service. And, and I think for me, finally, for trust-based leadership, it's, for me, it has been not just about internally what's happening in our organization, but a commitment to external leadership as well, to work for a trust-based ecosystem. As we, as we call it. And that then means centering relational work with funder colleagues, with community members, with whoever is in this wider system. And so, um, so that's, uh, I guess, a, a distinction, not a distinction, but I would, I would highlight the importance of thinking of, of your leadership role. How does that manifest internally and how does that manifest externally? Thank you so much for that, John. I really like what you said about leading is working for alignment. And I think that, you know, we had in our previous session, we really explored this notion of a trust-based culture. And part of what we're working against is this white dominant culture where individualism, uh, uh, individualism in particular kind of competition and, and these other types of values kind of thrive. And in those contexts, we don't celebrate collective leadership. We don't celebrate the work that it takes to lead to find internal alignment. And so we are really talking about acknowledging that we've been operating traditionally in a very different cultural context. And how can we use our role as leaders to embody the type of culture and the type of values that we really stand behind? Um, so next, I'd like to come to you, Brenda, another leader who I really admire as, as someone that has fully and intentionally leans into these values in your leadership style. Can you share in your words, what does trust-based leadership mean to you? Good morning, everyone. I am coming to you today from uh, <clears throat> the Bay Area, Loney land originally. I am a Latina woman. 
uh, with short black hair, wearing a black and white blouse, uh, sitting in the room with a fan over my head, makes it look like I'm a helicopter. Um, and I am really delighted to be here today and a little bit awkward to be talking about leadership in, and trying to share my own leadership style when it's sort of contrary to the notion of trust-based leadership, which is you don't stand up in front of the room and rah-rah yourself. So I just want to, I, I want to name that. And I think, Shadi, before we learn, before I share what does trust-based leadership mean to me, I want to talk a little bit about what it doesn't mean. Um, I've been in philanthropy way too long, and one of the things that I witnessed as I was growing up in philanthropy was that many of the leaders that I saw on big stages at national conferences tended to lead with ego, with power, with a loud voice, tended to be showcasing their foundation, their board, their grantees. Um, and for a long, long time, I did not think that I ever wanted to be a CEO because it did not feel authentically who I was. I could not see myself. Um, really cheerleading myself and putting me out there as sort of the, the leader. Um, but I have had an opportunity to meet wonderful people, including John, who has modeled for me what does it mean to be a humble, quiet leader that really brings together collaborative leadership that uh, demonstrates how to listen authentically, how to show up differently. And I want to get to some to some examples because I think it's it's helpful. You know, it's good to talk about this at a broad level, but it's helpful to hear a little bit more about what does this mean. Um, so it's things like when you're in a room, don't take up all the air in the room. Uh, try to sit there and listen first before you jump in and try to offer what it is that you think you have to offer to the conversation. It means thinking about how you dress. Um, one of the things that's been interesting working in Montana is that I had to put away all of my business clothes from the Bay Area, even business casual, and show up in jeans and a flannel uh, shirt in order to be able to um, connect with people on a different level. Um, it means thinking about how to bring your whole self. Uh, so one of the things I did when I first got to Montana was go around and drive, meeting different people across the state, trying to build authentic relationships with them. Um, my mom happened to be visiting with me and I, I brought her along and uh, left her in the car, to be honest, because I didn't think that it was appropriate to bring my mom uh, on one of these visits. And uh, one of my grantees saw her sitting in the car, asked who she was and uh, said to me, uh, you don't leave your mom in the car, Brenda. Um, and she uh, asked me to bring her out and share her. And my learning from that experience was that people wanted to know who I was, my whole self, not my CEO self. And it allowed me to build a deeper connection um, that it was very different than sort of the traditional, oh, I don't show up with my mom at an event. Um, and so it's that wholeness that, that, that you bring your whole self, your authentic self to listen uh, and to engage with people in building those relationships that really allow you to see the other person uh, not just be with the other person. Thank you so much for that, Brenda. I do think it's really helpful to articulate what is not trust-based leadership. And I think one thing, a couple of things that you mentioned that would are worth underscoring. One is what you're describing is really approaching your role with the deep sense of power consciousness and recognizing how you're showing up in a certain way. You're also talking about bringing your whole self, which is not the norm in our sector or really in our culture in general. We set up these kind of personas like the work persona, the family persona. Um, and you know, over the last couple of years, those lines have blurred more as we've had kind of literal windows into each other's homes. Um, and, and I hope that it's kind of leading toward more momentum where we can really be embracing of, of each other's wholeness. Um, but it does take that modeling from leadership to really make it sense of, I think the way you've described it, Brenda, to create a sense of psychological safety that you can show up fully in that way. Brenda, you've also mentioned this, this notion of situational leadership and situational power, because we wanna recognize that today we don't necessarily have everyone on this call who's in an executive role or in a trustee role. Um, 
And so I want to acknowledge that, you know, there, there are other ways to recognize where your leadership shows up. And you've described this as situational leadership. Can you speak to that, Brenda? Yeah, I think it comes from my experience having been in philanthropy in a variety of different roles. I've been everything from a program associate to a CEO and everything in between. And I think one of the reflections I'll share from those experiences is that in every one of those roles, I had some kind of power. Uh, initially at sort of the ground level, it was that power of who I was talking to, who I made time to meet with, how I showed up in those uh, conversations. Um, and then as I moved up the, the ladder, uh, obviously gained more power and more influence. And in all of those roles, um, you know, I often had to ask myself, uh, what power do I have in this particular role? What decisions do I actually make? And we make decisions every day from little itty bitty ones of what am I going to do first thing in the morning to big ones, you know, in, uh, uh, in terms of being a CEO. And then thinking about how do I not make this decision by myself? How do I think about who is going to be impacted in that decision? How do I engage those individuals, communities, organizations in being part of that decision um, and using my power or sharing my power in those instances so that it isn't me coming in and making all the decisions. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, in philanthropy, we're constantly in our roles looking up for permission. You know, as a program officer, you're looking up to the VP, the VP is looking up to the CEO, the CEO is looking up to the board. Uh, what if we flip that a little bit? And we said, let's, let's go out there and try something. Let's be a little bit um, bold and risky um, and, and try to push our organizations, try to push ourselves, try to push our supervisors to think very differently. And I've seen it work. It doesn't work all the time. I'm not naive. I know that power is a very powerful thing, but I have seen instances where I've pushed the envelope a little bit um, in a variety of different roles. And I have been able to affect some kind of change that for me was more values aligned in the way that I was doing the work. Um, so my, my, my call out to my colleagues who are on this call and across the field of philanthropy is to really sit and examine where you do have power in your role and how do you shape that power in a way that is more aligned with the values of trust-based philanthropy. Thank you, Brenda. That's really great advice and great insight. Um, so we're gonna transition into talking about going, going more deeply into what it looks like to put trust-based leadership into practice. We've gotten some great examples already. Um, and I, I also want to uh, just remind the group, we won't have time for a formal Q&A. So if you have any burning questions that are coming up for you, we have a team that's ready to answer those from the Trust Based Plan 3 project. Um, but also if you have specific questions for panelists, please put them in the chat and I will do my best to bring those into the discussion um, as we're kind of flowing through some of the, the, the predetermined questions. So you're invited to share any panelist questions and we'll keep an eye on that. Okay, so moving on to you, Maylee Walker, Executive Director of the Clineal Foundation, a family foundation. Um, family engagement is part of your leadership role as a family foundation ED. Can you speak to what it looks like to put trust-based leadership into practice in that particular context? Definitely, and good morning, everybody, and good afternoon as well. My name is Maylee Walker. I'm the executive director of the Clineal Foundation on this unceded land of the Lenni Lenape people. I'm half Chinese and half white. I've got a lot, a lot of freckles on my face. Um, brown hair about to my shoulders with a pink shirt on and a um, painting behind me that has some birds and some, some leaves on it as well. I'm, I'm so excited to be here and I'm excited to talk about what this looks like from my own experience in the Family Foundation context. Just to give you some context of my experience in the Family Foundation world, so I've been in my role for 14 years. And um, at the Clinical Foundation, it was big, very clear to me on day one that we have two bottom lines. So one is to serve the grantee community and then the other one is to serve the family. And so we do have two audiences in our work and it's real. And what that looks like was last year, we had 23 family members involved in the foundation, reading proposals on committees, on the board in some real way. Um, 
and that spans three generations. And I think the other key piece, like many foundations, the family wants to stay private. And so that's something that we keep in our work and, and we keep in mind when we talk about transparency with our work as well. As far as grant decisions, um, we grant about 4 million a year. We have four staff, three of us are full-time and all our decisions are made by committee. So for every grant program, we have a different committee structure with family and board members on that. And as staff, we don't make decisions on final grant um, recommendations and we do provide the due diligence um, and the, the reflections on those. So what does this look like in a family foundation? Well, as I reflected on it, I realized there's some pieces of the family foundation that makes this, that made this so easy for us to be a part of. I think one key aspect is culture. And as the saying goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and our family is involved because they care about each other. And honestly, that gives me the opportunity to care for my staff, to care for grantee partners, and allows me to lead by caring, which is how I'm wired anyway. It also means that when we have to say declinations to possible grantee organizations, it makes it that much harder because we've developed a relationship. I have been on tears with organizations that have not gotten funded. Sometimes I feel the pain more because I feel guilty of the time and energy that they put into something, even if it was the right decision. And so it makes our roles that much more satisfying, but sometimes also that much harder. And also we have family engagement because people want to learn. And I think if ever our board or family got to the point where they weren't learning, they would not be engaged. And so that is helpful in a trust-based philanthropy context and really looking at our work from a lens of learning. Um, and so that has allowed us about five years ago, we shifted to all multi-year general operating support. And because of this focus on learning and caring and relationships, it made that easy. We've never looked back because quite honestly, if we have a three or a four year structure for a grant, it allows us as staff to actually build relationships with the organizations when for many, many years we had one year grants and our conversations were always saying, okay, well, are you ready for the next proposal? And it was always a proposal discussion, not a discussion on really what's going on with the organization. So we feel the difference. In terms of leadership, I think for me personally, it can be challenging um, to have a trust-based philanthropy aspect. And some of it is my own leadership style. I love creating harmony. I love creating harmony across difference. A big part of that is because how I grew up, growing up with a woman, my mother who was an immigrant from um, Taiwan and my dad who was a white um, American man, there was much love in that cultural differences, but quite honestly, a lot of conflict and a lot of heartache. And so my role as a child was always to try to find the bridge and the harmony between that. And I think I bring that into my leadership. And as we all know, when we live with these inequitable structures, whether I benefit from them or I struggle with them, that's hard and that's discomfort. And if I'm here to learn with my board and family and staff and grantee partners, I've had to learn how to be comfortable with that discomfort and how to be comfortable with conflict and not try to rush in and solve everybody's problem, but to let it go. And so I think in the leadership aspect, when we talk about this trust-based philanthropy, for me, it's being okay with not trying to make everything okay when, you know, quite honestly, as we all know, the world's not okay right now. Thank you so much, Maylee. Um, so much wisdom there. I think especially the point that you're raising about sometimes this means getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, we're not talking about, you know, this is not all like rainbows and unicorns all day long. It's hard work. Um, and also what you're hearing and what Maylee is sharing is there's a kind of self-reflection and a self-awareness that comes to this work being, you know, really embracing and, and modeling trust-based leadership. So thank you for that, Maylee. I'm going to bring us back to John and we're going to hear from Jorge in a minute also. Um, we're really delighted to have an ED trustee uh, pair here to really kind of speak to what does that relationship look like? Because so much of what we're talking about in terms of building relationship, building trust, it really is about establishing that internally um, at the staff and board level, um, at the CEO and board level. Um, so John, first, just starting off with you, just setting some context for, for our, uh, our, our 
participants today, you have been with the Whitman Institute through many phases, um, from working with the living donor to taking the, the reins as the executive director after the living donor passed away, and then identifying a co-executive director in Pia Infante, um, and now leading the organization or co-leading the organization through a spend out. So how have you leaned on or um, relied on your trust-based values as you've led the organization through these many different phases? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I was thinking of when I, the difference when I was working with the, the living donor who passed away in 2004 and after. Um, and I would say what, what I leaned into when I was leading the organization when the living donor was around were um, remain, empathy and curiosity and, and um, still centering relationship in what was a, often a difficult relationship um, where, you know, you had to kind of pick your battles more because, you know, there are political realities in organizations sometimes. And if, you know, if you're wanting to stay, sometimes you have to um, be a little more strategic um, if, if the power differential is, you know, greater. Um, that changed when he passed away and I was left to lead the foundation. And so, you know, in effect, some people have said I was like the second founder. And so in that sense, I was able to fully start bringing in these values that we've talked about and things Brenda uh, and Maylee have referenced in, into, into leading the organization. Um, and so that started with, um, uh, invitations to rebuild the board and who was on the board and, and building a trusting relationship with the board. Um, Pia came on from the very beginning in a part-time capacity. And so again, was embodying in that working relationship, these values that we are talking about. And that led over time to her becoming co-executive director. Um, and what I say about that is what was deep learning for me was that was an instance and it kept going of, of when I gave up some of my own personal power, which in this case meant decision-making power over grants, communication through, that we, we, we became a more powerful organization because I had given up some power so that collectively Pia could be out in the world in a different way as the executive director and have that authority. Um, over time, another instance of that was uh, taking a back seat to new board invitations. So our board over time transformed from a largely white older boomer board to a majority people of color board and a younger board. And so I think leading means also a commitment to making or and looking for the opportunities to um, change who, who's in decision making roles in the foundation, you know, foundation boards are still very largely white um, and resist. And, and so I think there are important structural pieces as well as in, to, to pay attention to within organizations and also really important um, personal, um, interpersonal um, uh, factors. And I have just over the years struck by working, try, aiming to be more collaborative, aiming to invite people in. One of the, one of the practices of trust-based philanthropy is listen and act on feedback. And I think sometimes in the practices, I think that can sometimes get hopped over. I think it's really key in building the kind of culture we talk about that you are listening and then people actually see that you paid attention to what they said. 
And that, not always, but you incorporate that feedback. And, to, and I think when people see that, that builds trust in them with you and your leadership. Oh, you're not just saying that, you're, you're actually uh, evidencing that. So I think over the years, I have just um, learned how important it is to, um, to listen and, and look for opportunities to bring people in and have them give input and share in decisions that are being made um, within the organization. Um, yeah, I'll just stop there. Thank you, John, so much there. Um, one thing I wanna underscore that John has, has shared about a number of times is this notion of in giving up his personal power, he was the organization became more powerful. And that's something to recognize too. We're not, we're talking about seeing beyond the individual and recognizing this kind of collective systemic power that we can contribute toward. Um, that's a great segue to Jorge Blandon, who's been very patiently waiting. We have not had a chance to hear from him yet. Um, so Jorge, I wanna bring you into the discussion, particularly with your lens as um, a board member, board president, of the Whitman Institute, bringing a lot of um, financial expertise and knowledge um, and doing among your many you know, roles as, as board president, part of your responsibility has been um, really stewarding the organization through its spend out. Um, we often hear from you know, board members who really take seriously their fiduciary responsibilities. So how have you leaned into some of these values of inquiry and um, humility in your role in trying to responsibly guide the co-executive directors through this spend out? How, how have you leaned on these trust-based values and what does that look like? Yeah, um, um, buenos dias, buenas tardes, good morning, good afternoon. Just thank you for the, the invitation and just appreciate being here in a conversation with, with you all. Um, I connect uh, today from the East Bay, uh, Northern California, ceded land of the Ohlone people. I am a Latinx man in his late 40s. I have a shaved head, or as my seven-year-old son calls it, uh, cabeza brillante. Um, I am wearing a, a gray sweater and I have a white uh, door frame immediately behind me. Um, yeah, you know, like with, with Mother's Day, like around the corner, I was reminded when I called my mom and, and tried to explain what my role was gonna be uh, at the Whitman Institute. And I was like, I'm on, you know, I've been invited to be on this board of a foundation that is fighting for political and economic equity that leads in dialogue and relationship building. I went on and on and on trying to explain what the Women Institute was, was all about. There was silence at the other end of the line. And, you know, she said, pues, si te invitaron es por algo. So if you were invited, it was for a reason. And it was actually, you know, it stuck with me. And, and you know, yeah, I was invited and I was raised Right, that when you are invited somewhere, you don't show up empty-handed. And so, right, I, I brought with me uh, tools that I picked up along the way in the world of finance and put them at the disposal of John and Pia. Uh, you know, I brought a perspective from, from helping to, to run a nonprofit organization for, for many years. And I also brought a perspective of a, a Latinx, you know, man that knows what it feels when, when power is stripped from, from him and when power is exerted over him. So I brought my entire self, and that's one of the mentions of how I saw my role, is really bringing my entirety. Um, I also saw my role, like, yes, with this big sense of responsibility, which, to be honest, at first was a bit misplaced, because it was easy to think of, like, wow, you know, here's a foundation that's spending out, and, and, and I get to direct the legacy, what legacy looks like, right, as a, uh, as a board member. And, and I quickly realized that I had some ideas, uh, but, but I really didn't know. Um, so my role really went from thinking I would play a part in directing to, to really learning. Um, learning how John and Pia as co-EDs had arrived at, at this place, uh, taking the time to understand their perspectives and, and how that was informing their day-to-day -day decisions. So my role became one of leading with curiosity and, and inquiry, and yeah, identifying where my perspective you know, might be helpful and offering my support uh, in service. And so ultimately my, my role became letting John and Pia know that that, you know, that they're not carrying right, this, this, this work, work alone. So as a result, you know, John, Pia, and all the board members, you know, we've created a space where ideas and, and lessons can be shared 
uh, where experiments uh, can take place, um, where you know we honor the relationships that John and Pierre are building outside of the Whitman Institute uh, and the board. Um, so before trust-based philanthropy project was the trust-based philanthropy project, you know it meant going to like gatherings and seeing how other leaders were also excited about a trust-based philanthropy, and it was that that sense of learning. Uh, by all board members and a culture of support, not control, that, that made it easy for the board to, to endorse uh, spending a significant amount of the foundation's limited resources, remaining resources in the trust-based philanthropy project. Thank you so much, Jorge. Um, John, I'd like to invite you in. Um, how has this been for you as an ED working with Jorge? Um, what, have, what has surprised you or what um, advantages has this brought for the organization? And I guess I'm asking a bunch of questions, but really just kind of, are there any observations you'd like to bring about this relationship in particular that others might be able to take away and how they think about their relationships with their board members? Yeah, I, I would first just underlie that um, how appreciative I've been of the, of the support and the trust and, and the good thinking that Jorge and the board has brought. So I think it's, it's looking, it's really looking at your board as a resource and, uh, and, and relationships that are there to support your leadership. And, and, and this is where you, you feel like that the question of alignment and you're working shoulder to shoulder so it becomes less of, oh, are they going to approve, or how do I how do I work? Like the board is something to work with and manage. The roles become different, and it, it, the board is is uh, a, a, a great resource for the team to help you think more strategically and practically. You know, um, our, you know, Jorge mentioned, you know, finances and spending out and just the technical stuff around that. To be able to know that I have people who have my back and who have more knowledge than I have and I can turn to is huge. And so I, I think one part of leadership for me is the ability to ask for help, which sounds very basic, but I think can be hard to do sometimes. So if you, if you create a culture where you can all ask each other for help when you need it, and that's modeled all throughout the organization, um, and, that, and that includes bringing your whole self, it becomes very powerful. So I, I think my experience has been sometimes over the years, I've certainly heard a lot of EDs and others you know, they will ha have issues that they're trying to work through with their board. Mm -hmm. And I, all I'm, I guess the point I'm trying to make is if you reconceptualize roles a little bit, this focus on learning that has come up, focus on bringing your whole selves, and you culturally create the time, which is, this is huge, create the time to center relationships, then a whole different kind of organizational culture becomes possible. And knowing you have that support of the board in our instance, because we have had this outward focus of leading with others with the Trust-Based Philanthropy Project, that helps fuel your ability to lead outside the organization because you walk into rooms knowing you have the alignment of the whole organization and the board and you're not thinking, oh, you know, you're not looking over your shoulder or, oh, can I say that in this forum? I mean, I, I'll, I'll stop there. But for me, it does, the board relationship can become a transformational one. And I know that's, uh, oh, can be hard to get there, but if you get there, and I think through these trust-based values and leadership, then uh, your organization is able to go to places it wouldn't have otherwise. Mm. 
Wow. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We are running out of time, but I, I want to just come back to you, Jorge, because you raised something that really struck me that I think can be instructive for others. You were sharing that when you first came into your role, you were kind of poised to, you know, direct a lot of the spend out, you know, the organization through its spend out. But then quickly you realized that you needed to spend some time really understanding John and Pia's vision and intention in order to be able to do your job and steward it. What, what was that moment or how did you, what, what was the kind of trigger or moment that, that made you realize you had to take some ego out of it? Cause you had to give up a little bit of that ego in service of the org. What, how did you, what was that process like? Uh, you know, I, I think, I mean, you know, we're all shaped by my own personal journey and experiences. Um, I think it was like taking the time to self-reflect and um, having been exposed to all these other different like, power right, dynamics, um, you know, running a, a, a nonprofit or in the world of finance and just really taking a step back and reflecting like, well, how would I want to be supported? Um, and then trying to model that in right, the support of, of others what, what I boiled boil down to. And so once sort of I centered that, that question in terms of, you know, um, uh, how I wanted to engage, right, John and Pia, it just opened up, right, the, the possibilities of, of me, right, um, asking a lot of questions, right, and, and listening, and then um, asking more questions, right, and, and getting to know the other board members, and bringing in sort of their expertise, understanding their ex expertise and, and perspectives, and then asking more questions. So really like leading, leading from this place of, of inquiry and, and curiosity. Um, but it really came from that place of, let me just self-reflect, like, well, how do I wanna be, how would I wanna be supported, right? Um, and again, uh, trying to model that and, and support and serve right, uh, of others. Mm. That's really, really strong. I think that we all, anyone in any role, thinking about how would I want to be treated, reminding ourselves of that. I think especially important when you gain access to a powerful position like sitting on a board um, and, and really kind of taking that moment to self-reflect. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in our remaining time, uh, I have a lot of questions that will not be covered, but um, I guess just kind of thinking, um, I wanna come back to you, Brenda, um, in the context of, of building a whole new foundation from the ground up, moving to a new state, um, what was your process of building trust as a new leader in a new state, launching a new organization? How did you lean on your values to, to lead with intention and foster trust? Well, I think it, it helps that I wasn't from Montana. I'd never been there and I didn't know anyone. And so I entered into the space with a lot of humility um, and um, that's very different than coming in, uh, having a lot, a big network and having all of the answers or thinking of having all of the answers. Um, so I think that was beneficial. Um, there was also a lot of what I described as windshield time. Montana is a very large state, takes hours to drive from one town to another. Um, and I drove around Western Montana the first six months that I was here talking to anybody who was willing to talk to me. And it was everyone from high school uh, youth groups to hospital CEOs. And every time I met with someone, um, I tried to authentically listen to what it is that they wanted to see happen as a result of Headwaters coming into being in Western Montana. And then also ask them, who else should I talk to? Um, knowing that I, I probably didn't know who were leaders or who were people that were doing important work in our state. And that just led to a lot of additional conversations. And after all was said and done, I had spoken to almost a thousand people um, in Western Montana, which is a significant amount given that, you know, less than a million people live in our state. So it, it was a pretty good representative sample. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I think was important is um, really creating opportunities for communities to self-determine. So out of the gate, um, we actually did not put out RFPs and LOIs and all those traditional approaches to getting funding out. Uh, we let community decide what issues they wanted to work on. We used participatory grant making practices to allow them to choose who they wanted to receive the funds in their community. 
um, we made grants. Uh, as long as you were mission aligned, we gave you money. And uh, there was not a lot of the traditional due diligence and all, all the other things that we make organizations go through. We started from a place of trust and said, we're going to give you this money. It's going to be the beginning of our relationship building. And then we're going to build off of that. Um, and then the other thing that was really important is to really model what it is we were saying we were doing in terms of listening and following through and letting community lead. Um, we work on a lot of native land uh, reservations and uh, they have a history of colonialism and a history of funders and government coming in and uh, telling them what their problems are and what the solutions are and uh, had a lot of distrust. And I had to be open to that idea that there is no reason why they should trust me and that it would take time and me showing up in community, going to community events, going to the powwow, being there, not in the context of a funder, but as a community member that was interested in learning about what was happening in their communities. And over a two year time period, finally getting to the point where I had built enough of a relationship with key leaders in these organizations and these communities that they actually felt now like they wanted to work with us authentically. Um, so it really comes down to time, you know, making the time to really center relationships, as John said, um, not being in the office, not not having my work be the focus, not having the board be the focus of my work, which is what we do a lot in philanthropy is we, everything is about the board meeting and about the board conversation, about the board chair. And instead saying, I'm actually gonna prioritize my time, not spend a lot of time on the board and really spend a lot of time being with our community and our grantees um, across the state. And that I think has been a, a real um, transformational way for us to engage uh, with our grantee partners. Mm. Thank you so much for that. So we're, we're winding down the hour. Um, we're gonna move into breakout soon. And I'd like to just invite all of us to just take a moment to reflect on where you hold situational power. What, you know, how, where do you hold that situ situational power in your role, in your organization, in the greater ecosystem that you operate within? Reflect on it if you want to write it down for yourself, please do. And with that final re reflection question, I want to invite our panelists to just offer one, one nugget that you want to lift up that came up in this discussion, discussion as people reflect on their own situational power and how they can, um, how they can consider that as they strive to embrace some of these values that, you, that we've been talking about. So one final word of advice for our folks on the call today who feel moved to lean more intentionally into trust-based leadership from whatever position they hold, wherever they have that power. Um, and then we'll move on to breakouts. So I'm just gonna go in the order that, well, I'll just, well, we'll come back to you, Maylee, because we haven't heard from you in a moment. And if, you, if each of you can take about a minute or less, just giving your one reflection that you'd like folks to kind of walk away with. Yeah, I love what Brenda said is it takes time um, and it's for us to build with grantee partners and honoring the history of distrust that we're stepping into. And um, yeah, it just takes time. Thank you. Jorge. Yeah, I think from the perspective of trustee, right, I, I recognize, you know, that I was invited. I was invited to join a board that doesn't look like your typical board led by women and individuals of color. And so I think, you know, the reflection is sort of, uh, what are you doing as a trustee to make sure that the voices of those that are most proximate to the challenges you're trying to solve are at the table? How are you exercising your power to allow those voices to, to come in and, and, and have a say? Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Brenda. Um, I would encourage everyone to spend some time reimagining uh, what leadership means um, that is different from the white dominant hierarchical uh, culture that we tend to operate in philanthropy and um, work collectively with your teams to share that reimagined leadership and that um, shared power. Wonderful. Thank you, Brenda. John, uh, a final reflection for folks. 
Yeah, I just underline what uh, was all just said. And, and I think that this notion of bringing your whole self and inviting others to bring them whole, their whole selves, uh, creating the time for that, um, and um, being imaginative about reconceptualizing roles and, and um, in, in this framework of partnering in a spirit of service. Mm. Wow. Well, I wish we had more time to dig in, but um, just so much gratitude to all of you, John Esterly, Jorge Blandon, Blanda Solorzano, Maylee Walker. Thank you all for really modeling what we're talking about, showing up as your whole selves, uh, modeling vulnerability. Um, I certainly learned a lot from you all today. Um, so thank you. We are now going to move into small groups. Uh, so if you are a member of EGA and Blue Sky Funders Forum or SAFSF, you will be automatically assigned to your breakout room. Um, for those of you who are members of our collaborating organizations, you can click the button at the bottom of your screen for breakouts to find your breakout room. And if you are not affiliated with an organization or your organization's not hosting a breakout, you can stay in the main room where we'll continue a discussion. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we did not get to a lot of the questions in the chat. Uh, I noticed a lot of questions that were specific to a lot of grant making practices, some of the structure and, and practice elements of this. Uh, we invite you to join the Trust-Based Philanthropy Peer Exchange where, where we invite um, a lot of inquiry and peer sharing around a lot of those questions. So that's a great space to bring some of those questions. Uh, we also have a survey that we hope you will fill out to let us know what more you want from us. Um, Eddie, pop that in the chat. We will also send that to you in the follow-up email. Um, so with that, we are going to go off into breakouts. We'll have until um, 30 minutes after the hour for these breakout discussions and we will close out in the breakout rooms. So um, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you again to our fabulous panelists uh, and thank you to all of our partner organizations that have really made this possible. We hope you'll continue to tune in for uh, events and programs from Trust-Based Philanthropy and our, our many wonderful partners. So with that, um, consider where is your situational power? Where does it exist within your organization or in the greater ecosystem that you're operating within? And how can you lean on that role to think about what that means for being a trust-based leader? So we will, off we go into breakout rooms. Thank you, everyone.